Welcome. Thanks very much for joining us this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Lynn Burling Manuel. I am CEO of United Soccer Coaches, and I will be your moderator this afternoon. Um, I am joined by your CEO, Skip Gilbert, who needs virtually no introduction whatsoever, but he's got to be the most communicating guy I have ever met. Um, I have let him know he makes me look bad as a CEO because he communicates so brilliantly to his staff and all of his, his uh, fellow folks out there. And we are also joined today by our special guest, Leslie Gallimore. Leslie is the commissioner of the new Girls Academy League, but Leslie has a long, long history in American soccer. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, and Skip, uh, USYS, uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, I think it's, uh, obviously we've all, a phrase way too often used by me recently, has been drinking. <laughs> through a fire hose uh, in this new position that I have. Skip had a little bit of advantage starting in January before COVID hit. I made the interesting decision to start in August um, after we were well into the pandemic and I jumped into youth soccer. So what that says about my intelligence and, and self-value is I'm not sure. So um, anyway, I, I do appreciate it, Lynn. And, and uh, I, I tell people this story and I won't take up a lot of time um, boring you with my gig, but uh, I did coach Division One women's soccer for 26 seasons at one institution. I uh, was involved at uh, one other institution four years prior to that, my alma mater at California Berkeley four years prior to that. And I was, uh, I, I played for four years at Cal. So all, all in told, I, I was attached to the Division One college game for 38 years. And um, for me, uh, it was always about the game and always about getting better. And I, I did dip my toes and fingers and hands and uh, into just about every other portion of soccer, including uh, my time as the Region 4 head coach for ODP uh, back in the 90s. And uh, that was about a nine-year stint. Uh, I worked extensively with United Soccer Coaches, the former NSCAA, uh, in coaching education as well as serving on the board. Uh, US, I'm a national instructor for U.S. soccer and have traveled and uh, been a coach with our U.S. youth national teams. So, you know, those are just a, a few things that kind of scratch the surface. Um, Southern California is where I was born and grew up. And my pathway, you know, when I say I'm passionate about all of it, I mean it because I've, I've lived in the shoes of the girls that are, are playing today. I've, I've walked in their shoes from the beginning till now. Uh, uh, I started out in AYSO, many of you know the name Ziggy Schmidt, who fortunately for me um, ended up in Seattle uh, coaching the Sounders for a stint and I was reunited with him, but I grew up in a day where, where soccer in Southern California for girls was just becoming available. And um, through <coughs> AYSO, USYS, um, and, and kind of moving through the pathway, I've seen the evolution of it from sort of the beginning till now for girls mm -hmm. in this country. Um, maybe not the very, very beginning, but pretty darn close. So um, I, I've had my, I, my, you know, I've had my fingers in a lot of different areas and uh, my decision to jump in with the Girls Academy came after watching um, sort of what happened when US soccer pulled the plug on the DA in, in April and left a, a very, very large population of elite level girls sort of hanging. And, and again, during a pandemic where uh, not only were they emotionally kind of, uh, you know, in a weird space as, as people and children, but definitely missing their coaches, their teams. And I just watched this whole um, sort of, <laughs> I don't know what you want to call it, but it was, a, it was not a nice time um, how adults were sort of treating kids as pawns, if you will. And so I became pretty um, focused on what was happening within the youth landscape. And um, the more my, I wouldn't say blood started to boil, but the more I started to sort of watch what was needed um, when I was asked, I, I surprisingly and surprising myself <laughs> jumped in. And here I said a couple months later, still drinking through a, a fire hose. Um, but, you know, I, I think with a much better understanding of where we are, where we can go, and how we can take advantage of this period of time. So I'm, I'm anxious to get started. And again, I'm happy to be here today to um, maybe enlighten some people as to the, G the Girls Academy, um, our mission, where we sit, our, our affiliation with USYS and, and MLS, and um, how I see that going into the future. That's great. 
I'm hoping my audio has cleared up. Is that the case? You're you good. It sound? Great. Thank you. Uh, you know, it worked perfectly until we started. I, you know, that is a, that is a life law. Um, let's kind of jump right into this then, because it's a question I'm going to have for both you, Leslie, and you, Skip. Let's start with Leslie. Why the partnership with US Youth Soccer? What does that bring to the GA? And what does the GA bring to US Youth Soccer? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the evolution of, of USYS and what USYS has meant in the youth landscape for a very, very long time. And in particular, I think with Skip's ability to understand the past, present and future is, has been really important to me, um, as well as understanding the, the landscape of elite youth soccer and where it needs to go. Um, it's just, I think, provided us with an opportunity to collaborate in an innovative way and create to be able to create a white label league for us to sort of autonomously operate within while finding different areas that we can collaborate on things like talent ID, how we look at the high school game, how we help with the grassroots, um, all the while maintaining um, our ability again to be autonomous and most importantly be competitive in a very, very competitive market uh, with other leagues. Great, thank you. Um, Skip, can I throw that same question at you for USYS? Why a partnership with the GA? What do you bring and what do they bring from your perspective? Sure, you know, and, and thank you, Lynn. From my perspective, I started with the organization back in January. And at that point, a lot of discussions about the creation of an elite athlete pipeline, both on the girls' side and the boys' side, had already been well kind of paved, you know, both from our staff perspective, but then also with our organizational growth committee led by um, Idaho's president, Bill Taylor. You know, they had done an incredible amount of work. And for me, as I, as I came in for the next couple of months, starting to get my arms around the organization, you know, we, we came out with a new vision, you know, which was to bring communities together through the power of soccer to make lifelong fans of the game. And so as we start to put that ethic together, we had three core values that we wanted to do everything with integrity, respect, innovation. And as I started to talk with the folks from GA before Leslie came in, you know, Ashley Fontes, Coomer, um, Grantnick Chatterjee, Wes Skeevers, you know, the three of them embodied those ethics, you know, and they started to tell me what the GA meant to them and where they saw it. And for me, coming from the Olympic movement, you know, and, I, and I'll take a page out of being sort of an Olympic historian. Whenever there is a new discipline in the Olympic movement, it's usually the Americans that end up at the podium. And then suddenly that sport or that discipline becomes important to the rest of the world. And unless the developmental pipeline of that sport is really strong, the Americans struggle to stay at the podium. And I think for where we are today, the women's team is sort of at that fence where suddenly women's soccer is now incredibly important around the world. And so therefore, you know, the women who have dominated for so many years in the past may not necessarily be a shoe in years to come. And so that meant for an organization like USYS, you know, you see the trophies behind me, you know, there's one back there that was given out back in the 1930s. We have the history, we have the size, but we needed to have that depth starting at the very top with an elite development pipeline for both the girls and the boys. And so when you put that mindset together with what I thought we were going to be walking into with the GA, which is, you know, an, an incredible team and now led by Leslie, who with her history, you know, we can just sit back and watch it grow, is literally going to be able to take our dream to ensure that the women in this country are going to be the, 11, the best 11 when it comes to international competition. And we're going to be able to do that. And we're going to be able to do it incredibly well. So we're really excited for that. We think that we bring a very strong, you know, kind of grounded perspective to be able to help the GA find those players. You know, we have through our 54 now state associations, we have boots on the ground in every state. We touch into almost every community in the country. If there's a player out there that deserves to be identified, we'll find them. And so when you put those two things together, I, I just see that the opportunity for success is going to be tremendous. And when you have success at the top, it fuels the growth at the bottom. 
And I'm all about that growing that recreational pie. So more kids come into the sport, stay with the sport, and then become lifelong fans of the game. Okay, now you got to top this, Leslie. Um, <laughs> I'm coming back to you, Les. Um, how, this is clearly a very competitive landscape right now. How is the GA truly different? Because you're making that declaration that this is a new and truly different kind of league. How does that, what does that look like? Uh, our sole focus is on girls. And so it's female centric and I can say it's female run. <laughs> um, but also uh, besides that, that it's, uh, it's, it's basically for the players and by the players we talk about. It's a, basically a collaborative uh, philosophy of creating a culture guided and shared by the core values that I think ex are going to, and hopefully already has, provided a unique experience in our programming for our players. One of the things that, that they did right out of the gate, even before I was on board and it um, enticed me to become a part was to listen to the players. And if you were to ask our advisory panel and our team reps, and even a lot of the girls um, that, that aren't represented on the advisory panel, uh, if they'd ever before in their playing career been asked what they want in their pathway, 99.9% .9 of them would tell you no. So uh, the voice of our players is very, very important to us um, and what they want out of their experience as a, as a youth uh, elite soccer player. And one of my things that um, you'll hear me talk about quite frequently when it comes to uh, girls in the game uh, specifically is I think when I first started playing, the sky was sort of the limit. We were just starting out and I just, we played to play and things started coming along. And then there was the opportunity of college. There was the opportunity of national teams. But I have watched over the last several decades, um, the vision for girls in particular uh, be narrowed. Even though we have a professional league in this country, uh, even though there are a lot more opportunities out there in the sport, um, I've watched, uh, I've watched the, the vision narrow meaning that the carrots of getting a college scholarship or making a youth national team seem to be the primary reason that a lot of girls play. Um, and then those things happen and those things either come and go or they don't happen. And, and then we, we sort of lose their attention. Uh, it hasn't been modeled to them to uh, become referees, to become people in marketing of soccer, to become season ticket holders, that the youth, that the, the pathway of playing can go far beyond college into domestic and international leagues, that women can be referees, they can be coaches. They, <laughs> the coaching piece is one, if I get, you know, I had a dime for every time I was asked why more women aren't in coaching, um, I can tell you why. It's not modeled to them. It's not paid attention to, it's not invested in, it's not required, it's not something that you go and look around the country at youth academies or youth teams and see women on the field as much as you would like to. So for, for me personally, um, not only is it a mission, it's a, it's a life goal to have um, even more of an impact than I feel like I've tried to have up to this point in that realm, um, is to broaden the vision of what the game means to girls specifically and to show them uh, that bigger vision and to aid and support them in, in staying in the game for life in whatever realm uh, they, they find themselves and to, to love it that much that it becomes a part of, of who they are. That, you know, years from now, Lynn, that those are the people that are going to be walking around the United Soccer Coaches Convention. Hallelujah. That's what <laughs> we want to see. A digital yeah. convention. Yeah. Um, Either way. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, you're talking about the girls' pathway, but you've put together a strategic alliance with MLS. So my question to you is what does that do for the GA um, and why MLS rather than say NWSL? Yeah, um, you know, in all of these things, it's interesting to be speaking to you right now at this point in time because it's October, no, <laughs> September, October, Whatever. three months I've been in my job. Um, and the league has been around just a teeny tiny bit longer than that. So uh, to be able to answer every single question like kind of broadly, is, is, you know, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do. Uh, the NWSL, and I know Skip and Lisa are pretty good friends, and um, she's another <laughs> head of an organization that took a job during a pandemic in soccer. So, you know, I've said this, and I've had a couple of discussions with Lisa, but, you know, she's someone I, I, I told her that uh, initially wished her luck, told her she did a great job with the Challenge Cup, and for the most part, left her alone because she's got her own um, you know, situation to tackle. The MLS is clearly a little bit more established than the NWSL, uh, but it, it, the pathway is the pathway. And whether 
um, every single GA club. And we have some in our league, obviously, with O.L. Reign and Houston Dash um, and the Arizona Royals are attached to, to women's pro teams currently. Um, and whether every, you know, NWSL team ends up having a GA at some point in the future isn't as important to me as um, as that every girl in this country, regardless of what league they play in, are supporters of the NWSL and know that that's part of where their pathway can go. And um, Lisa would agree is, is that we just have to show them the teams, the players, um, regardless of what that par partnership looks like, there will be collaboration all across the board. And, and that's the most important thing to me is that girls see it, they know it's out there, they know what it consists of, they know what the level looks like and they know, um, and, and they're fans of that league. So, you know, there will be discussions. And so it wasn't really a why and why not um, mm -hmm. as much as it was an opportunity for us because the boys, um, I wouldn't say had a head start. They kind of did, you know, when the DA folded, the boys had a place to go, the girls didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and that's something that I, I don't think should be lost on people. I've, I've often heard it said that, well, why didn't everyone just fold into one league? Um, well, one league doesn't really want everybody. <laughs> they may want their teams, they may want their players, but they don't want everybody. So um, there's enough room for competition in this country at the elite level. And so when the opportunity arose and they were already in discussions with USYS and the boys, uh, MLS uh, became a, a very good affiliation for us. And I've, I've always really admired Don Garber and the work he has done with the league. Uh, being a sounder till I die and a, a season ticket holder for you know, the past decade plus, um, I, I'm a huge fan of their league and how they run things and how they do things. Um, having a lot of uh, touch points with coaches in that league uh, throughout you know, my time at United Soccer Coaches, my time in coaching education, I'm just a fan of the league. And our affiliation is one that is getting like-minded people who um, value education and coaching. They value standards and the development of players, the treatment of players in a like-minded way to align with them um, and to have those minds and voices in the same room to be able to collaborate and have discussions. That's the primary focus of it, to be honest, is to just not reinvent the wheel, but to be able to have open, honest conversations and share things. Uh, you know, Fred Lipka, if he were here, would tell you that um, as many things as, as we've kind of asked of them and what they've done and what they've asked as many of us in return. And so, you know, the, the youth landscape for them is, is relatively new. So it's been, um, it's been a really enlightening and great few months of having discussions with them. And if they've been that great during the pandemic this early on, uh, I can only imagine how energizing um, they're going to be moving forward and how productive we can be in helping develop something great in both of our leagues. Great response. A great response because they have been very creative and very innovative. Um, a question. I, for I, I'd actually, I'd actually add Lynn and I, you know, I mean to cut you please. off, but no, no, please. I've, I've done that in the boardroom with you. A couple of times. Yes. I've done it to you too, though. So it's good. <laughs> You've done it back to me. but uh, <laughs> So Warren Smiley, I see you, Warren, is, uh, <laughs> is that uh, I would say, too, is for the growth of, of girls soccer in this country, uh, you know, they're in certain markets. And I, I haven't been able to touch on my own personal philosophy of inclusivity, is that there are some MLS next markets where um, there's already been a ton of interest in growing uh, girls competitive uh, elite level teams and academies uh, and, you know, in areas where they've been kind of shut out before, if you will. And to me, I think that's been a huge bonus for us to be able to go into different places and markets and have discussions with uh, clubs that have for a very, very long time proven that they can be competitive, proven that they have great infrastructure and leadership and players. And they've developed um, you know, as many college players and hand, handfuls of youth national team players as some other markets have, but for whatever reason, just haven't been included. And I think studying the landscape, studying the geography, um, connecting the country, uh, you know, kind of one area code or zip code at a time, um, the MLS helps us with that, to be fair. Well, it, it, and you are only, what, three months old, four months old. So it's nice to have partners at that point. It does, it does, Bring up the question though, is, is size. Um, what do you imagine, I mean, what is the right size for the GA? Do you have lots of room to grow or are you sort of where you'd like to be or have you gotten that far with the process of that? Yeah, kind of a combination of everything, you know, in our heads, we're, we're gonna, um, 
I think where there's been mistakes made in the past is growing too quickly and going for quantity and not quality. Uh, so quality and not just in the competitiveness, but all, all kinds of things is it has to do with um, demographics, being female centric, being ed education oriented, um, having a good reputation, having uh, you know a, an infrastructure that's, that's functional as opposed to dysfunctional. I mean, there's all these things that we have to del delve into when we're vetting academies that we think are, will do an honorable job of representing the GA. So I think this first year, again, <laughs> everything has an asterisk next to it, right? Coming out of COVID um, is, is one where we've had a lot of interest. Our application process is in the midst right now. We will start right after Thanksgiving to interview different academies. And if they're not ready yet, we'll give them benchmarks, not just say yes or no as to what they would need to do in the future to grow. Um, how big we go from year one to year two is so it's such a gray area based on, I, I, it's, it's tough to explain. The DA um, getting yanked out from under kids in April during COVID, there's, there's clubs and people just, start, we all know this in all of soccer at every level and all well, life in general, there's people fighting for their jobs and fighting to keep their clubs and, and, and fighting to keep kids enrolled in soccer. So, um, you know, elite clubs and academies are no different. They're, uh, you know, trying to engage their membership, so to speak, and their players and make sure that, um, that they're not only just able to pay their dues, but if they are paying their dues, giving them something for what they're paying for and trying to have seasons and do it safely. And it's, it's all those things that trickle down, right? So for us, it's not a, there's not a number right now. And to, to say that we've been able to fully strategically plan out um, several years would be um, a fib on my part. We have not. I don't think going from year one to year two, we expect to have this enormous amount of growth. We'll grow. We're at 69 clubs right now. If we add 10 to 20 academies, that would be, you know, somewhere I would guess in that realm. Um, maybe fewer than that. There might be some that leave our league that have that were put in an interesting position way back <laughs> in in April, and and so they're they're trying to figure out what to do next. But I don't judge anyone because it was a really tough time for everyone to figure mm -hmm. out what was going to happen. The good news on our part for the GA, what I can say is I think we've shocked the world a little bit. I don't think if you would have asked anyone back in April that we would be sitting here in the position that we're in in November, that they would have told you that we would be. It's been, um, we've had some really positive feedback. I, I think that this group of people that I, this board of directors that I came in and was hired by, um, worked tirelessly to get this thing off the ground. And again, rescue the playing platform for 7,000 kids, 7,000 girls. And, uh, and so we've worked really hard to, to just move forward every day with that. With, uh, with the MLS's help, with USYS's help. Um, it has been anything but completely seamless and smooth on the inside. Um, and, and not in a negative way, it's just, it's really difficult to start a league in the pandemic. So, uh, it, so but I would say the patience of our members, the patience of the people within USYS, the patience within the state associations to help us understand their processes, which is ongoing every day right now. And I think our director of operations, Amber Klimek, is on the call. She's really, in my opinion, done a tremendous job reaching out to the states and trying to be that bridge um, between USYS and, and the state associations. Um, because we're, I think we're in, we're not in all 54, I think we're in 27 or 28, Skip can correct me. But um, just to, again, when we can all come up for a little bit of air, uh, the process has been started, but there's still uh, there's still a lot of work to be done to make sure that we're all on the same page moving forward and that we can all uh, evolve and reimagine what this landscape can look like going forward. And that's not easy in youth sports, in any sport, soccer, what, I don't care, pick a youth sport. It's, sure. not, it's, not, re it's not easy to reimagine it or to evolve um, as fast as things move now. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just really appreciative of the patience that everyone's had um, during this time and we'll get there. Um, it, it has been a, a heck of a year so far. 2020 is, is shaping up. I mean, we're not that far along on some level, but it's, it, you know, it, it's going to end with a, with a bang, I'm afraid. Um, let's see, if somebody were saying, you know, you're coming in, we've got a lot of great teams in our town right now. Is the GA club going to come in and try and take our best players? That's often the great fear that someone has. How would you address that? Um, I, I don't, I don't really ever look at it that way, to be honest. I think, um, I, I think it's more one of those things where, uh, if you're player centric as opposed to self centric, that and you're open and you're inclusive and there's accessibility and inclusivity, 
that players, if it's truly a pathway without roadblocks, people find where they should be. So there's zero intention on the part of the GA to come in and start stealing anything. Our, our job is going to be to help, to collaborate and work with, and and if anything, widen the road um, where kids can jump on and, and make sure that we're doing it with uh, honesty and integrity. Uh, and and again, if if there um, is anything I've learned in a quick amount of time in youth soccer, is that people tend to and just in general, have their guard up and be a little bit territorial and not in a negative way. I, I think it's, I think over time it's happened for good reasons. I, I think there's been, um, you know, I, I think that in general um, there's been times where uh, there, there's been too much contention in, in, in youth markets. And, and I, I don't, I personally don't see the reason for it. Uh, and so our, my goal, our goal as a league is to, like I said, um, make sure that the pathway is open. Um, our standards will be there. We'll, we'll operate autonomously as a league. We'll collaborate with the MLS. We'll collaborate with USYS. Uh, and my job as the commissioner of our, our league is to make it as competitive as we possibly can. And if you, again, are player centric as opposed to self centric, then players will find their way. There's, you know, zero intention of coming in and um, swiping up everyone's team and, and that kind of thing. But it, it is something that if, players who are um, at the level that they need to be to compete at the top of the pyramid that they'll, you know, automatically and naturally migrate that direction. Uh, and if the infrastructure is right, the communication is right, the collaboration is right, and it's transparent, then I think, and we're, our structure is set up and we strategically plan together, as opposed to in silos, I, I think we can do some great things in youth soccer. I really do. For girls, um, it's time. It's an exciting model, I think, for everybody as well. I do want to let you know, please, it's, this is open for your questions. Please use the chat box. Um, we want to be sure that we are really getting Leslie and Skip to answer all the questions you have today. They've been very forthright. And that's, that's a really important and, and frankly, all too rare of a thing in soccer. So we want to take advantage of it. Um, from a state association perspective, and, and, and Skip, maybe this is for you, because we have quite a few state associations on this call. Um, anything that they should be thinking about in terms of their relationship with the GA? You know, I think, it, again, it goes back to the process. You know, we suddenly came in and said, by the way, we're dropping 7,000 kids into the USYS system through multiple states, you know, 28 different states that all have different registration formats. And we, by the way, we need to do it yesterday. So that alone in a pandemic was a very difficult chore. But again, I think the patience of the state associations knowing where we were trying to go with the GA and, and you know, kind of being good sports about it to embrace where we were, where we were going and then being able to help guide that. And I think realistically now the question is, how do we all support each other? You know, we know that we're gonna have a great elite development platform with the GA. Then we have thousands of clubs around the country that all have really good players. And as Leslie said, the goal isn't to, um, to try to cannibalize from one to the other. It's to allow those players that are truly ready to climb to be able to see that path and have it in front of them. Again, I go back to when I started in January, walking in and I asked, can we get a schematic of what the player pathway is? And what I got was a number of fingers all kind of putting together like this. And I thought, well, if you think about the football, American football, it's Pop Warner High School College Pro. You're done. In soccer, it goes along a lot of different circles and turns. And so I think what we're now seeing is the ability to potentially simplify that process so that players, parents, coaches, club administrators, state associations, USYS National, we all understand the journey that players can take. We can all celebrate in their success, we can share in their failures, but at least as, you know, as Leslie says over and over, we're giving the kids the opportunity to succeed on and off the field. And for us, 
having that ability on the field is really going to be up to Leslie and her team. And what we can do potentially off the field, we're going to be taking steps in the future to make sure there are resources available to be able to support those kids, you know, to help the characteristical development, to help, you know, when they're, th if they have mental health issues for kids that are going through troubles, to be able to provide those kind of resources so that truly we are a community. And that, you know, again, we grow as a community, we succeed as one. Yeah, well, I'll just chime in just to tag yeah. along with what, what Skip is saying too, is that, um, and, and I don't, for me personally, I don't want any of this to sound like uh, I have this all sorted by any means. And I told Skip this on a call recently and uh, our immediate goal is, is to survive into year two. <laughs> legitimately one day one foot after the other we were able to get our league season for the most part in in some parts of the country this year which was a, a huge testament to a lot of different people uh you know there's some parts of the country that are shut down that have not played yet the northwest hasn't played the southwest hasn't played uh you know i think illinois has had spurts of so you know there's been different markets and this the, it's just been interesting um, and, and for kids especially to look around and say like, well, it's like college soccer right now. How's the ACC playing and the Pac-12 is not playing and how, you know, so the, the whole country has been sort of all over the map figuratively and um, uh, literally as to how this pandemic has been handled when it comes to, to sports. And so for me to be able to, um, to say that we have it all sorted and there are so many things, Lynn, and you know me, it, yeah. there are so many initiatives and things that I want to tackle. Um, I, I don't have the bandwidth of someone like Sue Ryan that seems to get things done, you know, overnight and she just, you know. sleep, by the way. Yeah. yeah, she doesn't sleep. Yeah, Sue does something about Sue. But um, I, I, uh, I, I maybe take a little bit longer, but there's so many things that if we can not only survive, but thrive, start thriving into year two, um, I think there's a lot of things that we're going to be able to do um, together that are, are, are going to be outstanding. I just can't tell you that we've started them yet. It's been three months. Um, I, I can tell you that Chris Dukes, I think, is on the call. Chris and I met um, uh, a couple of weeks back, and he was on another call I was on yesterday. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with ODP and talking about, um, again, evolving, reimagining, how, how can that program um, be something that as the GA, we look at um, when it comes to talent identification. That's as far as I'm going to go today because Chris and I have met twice. There'll be a working group and we'll discuss it. Um, but right now it's not like the first thing on my list. It's an initiative that we need to sure. sort through, but people need to know that those discussions are happening and to tell you that there's something done, whatever, it's, it's just, it's not the case yet. USYS can't really speak on our behalf yet. And we can't speak on USYS's behalf yet. We, we just haven't had enough time to sit down other than to get started in this pathway to, um, to say that we've, uh, you know, accomplished any of that long-term planning yet. So I just, I kind of wanted to chime in on what, what Skip was saying there, but there, the, there'll be a time where um, I'll get really, really excited to be able to, to sit down and plan for the two to five year model of different things that I think, um, benefit both groups. No, and Lynn, I'll jump in on to Please. jump on with- You guys with, are answering all the so. questions I had, so keep going. <laughs> Is where there's so much focus right now and, and the focus of this conversation is at the top of the pyramid. You know, we also need to look, think from USYS's perspective and all of our state associations is that so much of the game is the grassroots level. And so many of our clubs live registration to mouth. And so when we have to cancel seasons and if we have, if the pandemic comes back and winter goes away and spring gets threatened, what is that going to do to the financial infrastructure of our club network around the country? And so we have to kind of gear up to try to look at ways to not just help the clubs, but manage parental expectations so that when the green light goes, every kid that wants to play has the ability to do so. And again, to bring it out and to bring them out with, you know, the proper protocols, but to make the sport exciting again, because the worst thing, and you're seeing it survey after survey is telling us that there is a potential that kids that might be sitting around for a year in their homes and not really that active may lose the ability to want to come back out and play. And what a shame that would be, because as, as a youth sport 
you know, professional, yes, we want kids to play soccer, but we want them to have a long, healthy and well, you know, lifestyle, you know, and that goes back to, you know, our, our vision of kids in it, you know, become fans for life. And so we have to look at both the top, the middle, the bottom of the pyramid to be able to make sure that the entire ecosystem of what we love as the USYS family is able to move forward. And so there's, you know, if, if anything, the pandemic, you know, has, has just added exponentially the workload we have because we're constantly looking in the mirror, you know, to Leslie's point with ODP. You know, we're not just sitting back and saying, all right, when everything gets going, we're just going to go back and do it as normal. I'm asking, I'm a structure and process guy. If we go from point A to point B, are we relevant at the end of the day? And is ODP as relevant as it was today as it was when I was playing in ODP? And if it's not, what do we have to do so that we can build it so that it is better tomorrow that for the players coming in today? And that adds a little bit of excitement to it because we know that we're going to be serving the needs of the player. We're not serving the needs of the system. We're not serving the needs of our bylaws. We have to serve the needs of the player. And that's what they want. Well, I think if anything, we are coming to the, all the conclusion that COVID is not just changing today, it is changing forever in some ways. And we're all figuring out what's that next phase look like for soccer and for whatever other parts of your life, because it is for everything. Let's see, do we have any questions from our audience today? You know, I've, uh, I'm seeing a couple that are coming in to me privately that, that says, you know, and this is actually a great one. What, what do we see as the great, greatest obstacle ahead? And, you know, coming from the state associations, what can we do to help? You know, and, and I think that's, you know, that puts the nail on the head. You know, what is the greatest obstacle? If you ask me today, it's our greatest obstacle actually are the politicians that are trying to make decisions as to where participatory sport falls. I got a note from Dan, Dan Cataldi from Iowa the other day that said, I don't get it. Bars are open, restaurants are open, theaters are open, kids don't have to wear masks in school. And oh, by the way, they shut all access to fields down. We can't play until December 10th. So you sit back and you go, there's, there's so much unknown out there. Yeah. How, did, how can we make any sense of that? And so the greatest obstac obstacle is really when we get that ray of light that says, go play, what can we do to take advantage of it? You know, and, and I think, you know, it's one of those that can we step outside ourselves and, and this isn't necessarily at the top of the pyramid, but can I talk to my colleagues and friends from football, baseball, basketball and hockey and come collectively to say, when we get the green light, what if we did a national promotion to celebrate sport? Everybody get out there this weekend and let's have a, you know, return to play day. And that again, jumpstart the ecosystem that is youth sport in this country. And if we can do that, then again, it gets everybody right back into the seat of, all right, you know, here's the path. And whether you're at the top of the pyramid or you're just playing for the sheer fun of it, you've got a place to play. Mm -hmm. um, you just, you mentioned obstacles, uh, Lynn, and I, I don't know, um, I think in, uh, to skip the question that got asked of Skip of what, what can they do to, to help? And to me, it, it, I want to flip it a little bit too. And and just say that we're willing and want to have conversations with different state associations because it's it's what makes this country great is that everyone's different the geography uh the landscape the you know the weather <laughs> every single thing about this country is different from one market to the next and so over time and and there's a couple things i, I said i needed from skip one was we need some things immediately to help us work seamlessly um, as far as registration and processes and learning each other's processes and learning the state processes, um, that needs to start to, to be seamless if we're going to be a league that people want to join because our current members are happy with how they're being serviced. Um, the next thing I need from Skip is time. <laughs> so um, it's just time, time to get to the point where um, we can start to, to have some discussions. You know, another one of the initiatives that I haven't um, mentioned, and I think I saw Scott from Hawaii on here, is mm -hmm. just this idea of some of the smaller states that have um, never been given the opportunity to have uh, an elite pathway, um, strictly because of their geography. Um, we all love going to Hawaii, so why should, you know, we all infiltrate their 
beautiful island. Why, why should we punish them for being located out in the middle of the Pacific if they're, um, you know, if they're, they're producing tons of college players, they're producing handfuls of national team players for as small an association as they are. So I've talked to Michelle Nagamini. Um, I know she has Scott in the loop. Whether it happens today, next year, or after that, uh, I will tell you, it is a goal of mine to try to be as inclusive as we can to, um, to associations and to, to academies more that, um, that kind of tick the boxes of, of our philosophy, that are girl-centric, that are education-centric, that are um, growth mindset oriented as opposed to closed mindset. And so I will always go to someone and say, you want to complain about what you can't do? What is it you want to do? What's the solution? How do we do it? Propose it to me. I will listen. Um, so, you know, for those of you that don't know me, um, I think that, that Lynn can, and several people on this call can speak to the fact that um, that's a truthful statement, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I, you know, time is going to be the thing that um, I need. Patience is something that I appreciate from everyone. And I've already said that you've been more patient than you probably um, should be with all of us. <laughs> and, but at the same time, hopefully, um, as we move along on this pathway together, you'll see um, the benefits to it, but that'll be over time. And I, I do think coming to me with proposals, if you feel as though you're in a market or you have um, clubs in your market that feel as though they, they have been a little bit shut out of the competitive top of the pyramid piece, um, we're willing to have that, that conversation. And I think for USYS in particular, um, in every state, you'll see that um, Every girl, if they have the aspiration and they know that opportunity is there, it will be good for the entire pyramid. It will be. And Lynn, just to again add on, on how, <laughs> the question of how we can help and how the states can help. You know, I'll go back to something you said at the top of the call, which was, you know, I send out every day, every morning, an email to our staff. And that's my way of being, I started it once we were kind of quarantined and I've kept it going because it allows me to stay connected to all of our staff who are all over the country. And I think the staff at this point is, you know, they're going to roll their eyes in the sense that a lot of times in my, my email messages, I'll round it, I'll, I'll come around to asking questions. What do you think of this? What should we do here? And I think that's the same to the states. There is so much institutional knowledge, expertise, mm -hmm. passion, and commitment with our state of association presidents, CEOs, you know, coaching directors, that they all have every so often, you know, little nuggets of things that they would love to see done. And realistically, I would say, put it in an email, put it in a text, send it to us. I collect those ideas and I, and I put them in the back of my mind and I see how we you know, integrate them and incorporate them into everything we're doing. Because again, now if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, it's given us the opportunity to look in the mirror and say, how can we come out of this bigger, better and stronger? And it's not gonna be just based on what we do here at the national office or you know, what I think sometimes, it's gonna be the collective energy and the input of everybody in our system. And if we're all on the same page and if we're throwing the ideas together, when we actually get these ideas out into the marketplace, we're going to be unstoppable. And it's going to, you know, it's going to allow us to grow the pie, bring more kids in and to give Leslie and the GA great players to be able to, to do wonderful things with. So, you know, I think we're poised to do all that. But, you know, for me, how can we help keep throwing ideas our way, throw comments, give us feedback not don't stop. I think it is one thing that this period has done for all of us is given us some time and space, frankly, to be innovative and to try new things because we had to. You didn't get a choice. Um, you know, we certainly feel that way with our convention. You know, we've obviously done work with USYS for a very long time with the convention. We were disappointed to go to, to leave an in-person convention for this year. But the digital convention is coming together as probably one of the most unique experiences I've ever seen. And we wouldn't have even tried under other circumstances. And I think those kinds of things are true for everybody. We're all trying new things. Um, well, I got, we a, are, I got a uh, question we, in, in, the, in the chat about, um, can they, they wanted me to explain what I mean when uh, I, I talk about the educational component. 
Um, sure. It's pretty, it's pretty far reaching. And, you know, when we talk about being standards based and, and there's a lot of people that, you know, kind of roll their eyes at that. Cause it's a, it's a word that gets thrown out a lot as standards and um, upholding those standards. And again, I'm, I'm really early on at this. I haven't been able to get out and see every one of our clubs, but I can tell you in 26 years of recruiting, I've seen a lot of them. Um, and so uh, I, I know what these coaches, what, how they coach. I know what they look like on the sidelines. I know how they develop their players. So from a, from a coaching education standpoint, uh, not only through U.S. soccer and the licensing program, but through United Soccer Coaches and promoting any education online or in person that United Soccer Coaches does um, and other partnerships that we'll have um, as far as not only educating our coaches and giving them programming within the GA that allows them um, to get better every day and to improve as coaches in their craft and, and to hold them to a standard is, is a huge part of who I am and why I'm in coaching. Um, and it's why I'm an educator. Uh, the other thing is, is our players. And I talked a lot about um, the, the advisory panel that we have. And just so you know, we have seven conferences. There's one uh, conference rep for every conference that we have. And then below that, um, every team, uh, every club has a rep. So there are 69 reps for each club in the country. And underneath that, every team has a rep. So it's over, you know, it's hundreds of girls uh, that have suddenly been empowered with these leadership positions and the education they're getting in conjunction with the adult leaders that run the advisory panel. And these are all women that are coaches, former professionals, um, women in the game. It's not all women, but it's definitely uh, a flip from normals. It's probably eight to, you know, 10 to one female to male as far as the adult leaders um, that, that help our advisory panel. But just this idea of empowering these girls at a younger age um, to take ownership in their own pathway and to, again, be exposed to people who have walked in shoes that they may one day want to walk in and know it's possible. Um, so that's part of the educational component. We also are very strategic and intentional uh, about the partnerships that we um, get into. And we haven't, we haven't really lacked for people uh, coming to us and soliciting uh, you know, um, themselves for, for partnering with us. We've, we've tried you know, to obviously uh, do a good job and you know, shout out to Ashley Fontes Comer for like, again, <laughs> she's been remarkable for our board. Um, not only getting the advisory panel set up and started, but with our partnerships and making sure that we don't take missteps and partner with someone that we don't feel aligns with our philosophy. And again, it goes back to being female centric, player centric. Um, and again, you can laugh at the MLS piece, but I think I've, I've explained that. Uh, I learned a long time ago with three brothers, you're, as a female, if you wanna get somewhere, you do not cut off your nose to spite your face. Um, and that there are you know, plenty of, of um, men in the world that are huge advocates mm -hmm. of women's sports. And one of the things I know for a fact the MLS has recognized is how important women's soccer is in the landscape of our country and, and their investment and time investment specifically in us um, has been remarkable. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to say that the education piece, we, we will often um, be doing uh, webinars uh, throughout the year with our coaches in, in different ways um, from, uh, I would say one of the most unique things that I've been exposed to is translating being an educator and a teacher into coaching itself. I don't think people always see it as the same thing. So just methods, not having to do with the game of soccer specifically, but ways to teach. And if, again, back to the pandemic, being able to engage kids on Zoom as teachers has been really difficult in this environment. Being able to engage soccer players as coaches on Zoom has been difficult. How do you reach kids? How do you teach? What are the most effective teaching methods out there? Um, and there's several experts that, that we will and have partnered with and had discussions with about um, educating our coaches on being better teachers and being better educators themselves. And Eventually, again, um, <laughs> my initiatives and my big picture thinking, this is all going to trickle down to the grassroots um, and getting older players, more elite players, coaching younger players, girls coaching younger girls, getting involved with teams. That's where coaching starts. Um, and uh, I, I, I have proof of it. And so the more we can um, let these, you know, give these players some credit and let them be out there, they will be the best salespeople for this league. Uh, that we'll ever need is that their experience and what they're uh, um, exposed to will be, um, you know, in my hopes, uh, one of a kind experience and top notch. 
I'm looking over, um, I just tried to think of something else. Um, uh, Amber has her hand up. Amber, did you have a question? Or did that an accidental button push? We're trying to unmute her. Yeah, so okay. yeah, that was that was accidental. Thank you. Okay, hi Amber. <laughs> hi. Uh, many, many of you guys have had discussions with with Amber, and I'm just reading another question over there. There is there are some questions actually about how many teams per age group will be allowed per a GA club, and then there was another one about is the goal um, down the road to be able to financially compensate academy teams when players move on to the top levels of the game. Sorry, I was reading. I was reading a question. Did you just ask me something? Yeah, there was about how many how many age groups teams will you or how many teams per age group will be allowed, and then are there any goals or plans to financially compensate academy teams when players move on to the top levels of the game? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a little bit of the compensation piece. We haven't. We, there's no way we've gotten that far in our discussions. Um, there are many of the top academies already in the country, and you'll look at the DA. Um, you know, the, the, the clubs that came from the DA to the GA, some of them are two top teams deep with two, three, and four teams underneath them playing in different levels in different leagues. Eventually to get those a little bit more aligned and solidified would be in the strategic plan for sure. It's not easy. Um, and then, uh, so right now on our application, and this is, this is another part of the strategic plan and processes that still need um, discussion to happen around them, but I'll just throw out that uh, right now, the age groups that we accept into full academy and GA status are U13 through U19 um, uh, as part of the qualification to, to be a club in the girls' academy. Uh, we will probably, and the boys' side has done this, I know, in the past, is give clubs the opportunity to um, join sort of from the bottom up. So if they have the three lower age groups, 13s, 14s, and 15s, and we can geographically map out um, clubs that, that fit that mold of starting you know, in year one with the three lower age groups and it doesn't um, wreak havoc as far as competitive fixtures and then being able to schedule drivable games to, to play one another. Um, we'll start to let some clubs in probably in year three with the first three age groups. And we, we might give them like conditional admittance next year so they can start to, um, you know, start to build their academy and, um, and, and, and as part of the GA moving forward. So, um, you know, I, I think, and one of the comments I've already gotten, and this is one that, again, you know, privately, and, and I 100% understand, and my job as commissioner is, I, I say it on every single Zoom I'm on. Um, I might have used a swear, I might have used a swear word yesterday in one of my conference Zooms um, in reference to, uh, anyway, I, I'll leave it at that. Um, as, as far as how the coaches within our academies behave, what they will quickly find out from me is that um, I don't, I just don't let things go very easily. And so um, the standard of behavior and how coaches within our clubs operate within their markets is going to be very, very important. How much I've been able to have my hand on that pulse early on is um, I would say minimal to mediocre. Uh, and I kind of do know the characters and the players in the market. So um, I'll be able to, to suss them out pretty quickly. Uh, but you know, if somebody isn't, um, operating with honesty and integrity, those two things and, and truthfulness, it, the honesty and integrity piece to me is, um, it's just a non-negotiable. And if there are clubs operating differently than that from my standpoint, they, they will be very short lived within the girls' academy. Regardless of what the crest on their jersey says or how many kids they have, mark my word. Uh, and Leslie is real straight up in that way. Leslie is a past president of United Soccer Coaches. And just as an aside, she'd mention Ashley Fontes Comber, who's on their board of directors. She's on ours as well. And she will serve as president of United Soccer Coaches in 2022. So um, we have we, our connection. We, got a, we have a very good board. I've been very, very fortunate in my role as CEO. That's for sure. Um, Skip, any final comments from you, sir? You know, one, Lynn, thank you for taking time from your day to come and moderate for us. Um, when, when we thought about having Leslie come in to talk to kind of our family, you know, you were the first person I thought of to moderate. So, you know, I really, appreciate that. And, and Leslie, I can't thank you enough because, you know, I, I know 
you've, you're still drinking from the fire hose, all kudos to you for getting the GA to where it is. And, you know, as much as you've said, it's been nice that we've had patience for you. We also want to thank you and your team to have patience with us. You know, we're all kind of forging new partnerships at this level. And, you know, it, it's sort of when you're doing it, when the world is normal is hard enough. When you're doing it with the pandemic and not knowing which way is up makes it increasingly difficult. So, you know, I can't thank both of you enough. And, you know, from USYS's perspective, we couldn't be more thrilled, excited, and optimistic about where we're going in the future. And, you know, it's one of those things, and I, I say it to the staff all the time, just buckle your seatbelts. We're going to go for one heck of a ride. And, you know, here we go. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate the time and the invitation, Skip. And I would I would get so much grief if I didn't give a shout out to my boy Terry Fisher, my homie here in Washington. So hi Terry. Uh, I always I always owe Terry something. I owe him a call. I owe him a list. I owe him I don't know, but the guy the guy named a trophy, the U15 State Cup trophy in Washington after uh, my longtime best friend and associate head coach at Washington, Amy Griffin. And he made sure that our trophy was just a little bit bigger than Cliff McGrath. So. You know, I, I have I owe a big debt of gratitude to Terry. Uh, and and Terry, tell us not to take his question, however, just so you know. That's <laughs> well, yeah. oh, Terry, Terry will he will ask me directly, so you don't have to worry about taking up time on here with Terry. So, um, but I, I see a lot of familiar faces on here, and you guys just need to know that um, moving forward, if we can all just be in a little bit, um, you know, new evolving headspace and, and keep a growth mindset and be patient with one another. I really do believe we can do great things. And um, I'm always available for a chat. It, it might not, um, I might not answer right away, but I'll definitely get to you. Uh, and, and that will be easier in the next coming months, I'm hopeful. So thanks so much. Yeah. And, and Lynn, you know, we should ask you one question. I mean, with your uh -oh. background through Soccer America, the coaches, what's your perspective of what's going on with all of this? Well, you know, one of the things we've always wanted to see was true collaboration. It has been frighteningly rare in soccer and my personal belief, and I think the belief of Soccer America has always been, that's, that's the answer to our entire sport being su successful. And it's something we're seeing in a way, at least the prospects of it, that is really very exciting for a seamless program, you know, between the recreational, the elite, the pros, that's a that's a new world for us. It's very exciting. So yeah, I think we all, none of us are very positive about COVID right now. It, it, there's just no question that it's a slog through this process of the moment. But I think for all of us, it's focusing on after COVID. This does come to an end. And sometimes it doesn't always feel like it, but it does come to an end. And the critical key for all of us is to survive, get through it, and, and to stay positive about the whole process. So thank you for including me today. I really appreciate being here. Skip, Leslie, you know, great leaders, and it's great to be a part of a sport that has you both. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. We had well over 100 people, and um, there's really positive and great things to look forward to. So thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend, and stay safe and stay well. <laughs>